She is the only Filipino and the only woman to be recognized at the 2022 Ramon Magsaysay Awards, championing child rights and protection. She is the executive director of the Child Protection Network at the Philippine General Hospital. With us and thought leaders, Dr. Bernadette J. Madrid. Good to have you with us, Dr. Bernie. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Congratulations on your latest recognition. Oh, thank you, Kathy. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm honored that you invited me to be one of the thought leaders that you're indeed, going to talk indeed. to. Indeed, you yeah. are a thought leader in child protection. And this, this is a, a double-barreled award uh, as it is because it was just last year that you've celebrated the 25th year for the Child Protection Network, which you set up. So it's, it's a double celebration, not yes. just for you, but for your team, your yes. multidisciplinary team who's worked with you all those 25 years. It is. And, uh, we, you know, it was an, an unexpected award, but the timing was just so great. You Why know, be, because uh, it validated that the past 25 years that we have worked uh, on this child, on child protection um, has given proof, <laughs> you know, that we're on the right track, that we've done something recognized to be significant for our country and maybe even beyond our country because the Ramon Magsaysay Award is uh, for Asia. And that's 25 years down the line journeying with, with your patients, taking yes. care of patients all of those 25 years because indeed it is a, a long-term commitment that you have with the patients, seeing them through their most difficult moments on child abuse. What, what, what were the most uh, memorable cases, would you say, or, or the most memorable patient that you've had in those 25 years? I still remember, and I don't think I will ever forget, uh, one of the first patients that we had. And uh, we, of course, don't mention the names, the real names of our patients, so we just like called her Anna. Um, and uh, she, was, uh, she was just discovered by a man who was walking his dog and the dog started barking. And so they found this three-year-old uh, child naked in a vacant lot. And uh, she was crying and, and she was, uh, you know, they immediately brought her to the hospital at the Philippine General Hospital. She was, she was covered with cigarette burns uh, she was obviously tortured. I mean, we just estimated her age to be three, but she could be older because she's malnourished. Uh, her, her nails were, were removed, you know, so, and she was raped. Uh, and, and you couldn't imagine anything more terrible that could happen to a child. But what was uh, inspiring about her story was that um, in the wards, you know, we are being taken care of by the nurses, you know, and it took a long time. Um, and she stayed actually months in the wards, but uh, she steadily improved. And finally, we were able to find uh, a shelter that would, uh, would take her in and place in a foster family. And, uh, and you could see her bloom, you know, when, when, when like, Five, when she was five, like estimated five, like two years later, would never recognize her as the same child. She was cheerful, she was talking. When we found her, she doesn't say a single word, word at all. So she was talking uh, and her foster mother described her as, you know, she's the most caring uh, little girl that you could ever have, you know. Uh, she was wearing a dress that was similar to her foster mother, the same cloth, and, and they, they just were so happy together. They visited us to say goodbye because uh, she was going to be adopted uh, to the United States, you know, so, but she was a different child. And, and, uh, and you could see that, uh, you know, these children, in terms of resilience and, and how they cope with so much adversity. Um, it, 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 they're, they're not only survivors, but they're, they're inspirations uh, to all of us. They're, they're not victims anymore. You know, that's why I think the term for them would be survivors, but I would just, just say that they triumph 
you know, overall adversity. And with your intervention, I mean, how did you get to that point of transforming what could have been tragic and into something triumphant? When, when you take into consideration the existence of the Child Protection Unit that you had set up back in 1997? I, I would say that um, the, the work itself, the way that you deal with patients uh, should be trauma-informed. So trauma-informed care uh, is so important. And, and that um, when, when, when children feel that you truly care for them, they respond. Um, you see, physically, it's easy to cure physical injuries, so long as it's not fatal. You know, physical injuries heal. You know, those burns, those nails, they, they grow back, the skin becomes normal. Um, it's the psychological part and the spirit, you know, that, that you want to nurture uh, so that the, the child, uh, you know, develops to really the best, to their potential and that they, uh, in terms of resilience, that they overcome that even most awful adversity that anyone could ever experience. So I think it's the caring uh, and also knowing what to do because um, there are now really, as we went, as we grew also, um, there are more evidence-based practices uh, that tells us what works and what does not work with abused children. Even therapy, no, not all therapy works. So being up to date in terms of the science um, is also very important, together with the caring, of course, for the child. And expanding that scope beyond children, because you've also started to take care of women mm. with the Women's Protection yes. uh, Unit, the yeah. Children Women's Protection Unit, the WCPU. Right. What were the most memorable instances where you encountered a woman who also achieved the same kind of triumph hmm. from tragic? Um, for us, because we're more the child protection unit, most of our children, re most of our patients are children. But, you know, what is the women, you, you know, um, it's really that, uh, you know, women, I don't know what, uh, by, whether by nature they are survivors, uh, but women are caring. You know, they actually, most of the women, as well as the children, they just want abuse to stop. You know, and, and, and that so long as, as, as they feel safe, you know, they, they can really do anything. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, most women would stay. You know, I think that is some would say that whether that's admirable or not. Why would you stay uh, with someone who is so abusive? But there's so many reasons why women stay. Number one, of course, is the children, and and number two, they could really love that person in spite of that person being abusive, and and they still hope. You know, they still hope that uh, the abuse would stop one day. Um, unfortunately, though, it really rarely does. And uh, once they've made up their minds that this is it, then they, they would go. I have a really tragic story, though, of, of, of uh, a personal friend, a classmate. You know, when, when we were in high school, I had a classmate who always came in with a you know, turtleneck, and then uh, and we thought that she was just being stylish. That's her style. That she has a turtleneck, but she was being physically abused by her boyfriend, and she, and she married that boyfriend, and uh, and they had uh, two children, and um, finally after all this year, she decided to leave him, and he killed her. He killed her in front of their two children. And at that time, I was still not, I was just a resident uh, at the PGH. And I had no knowledge how to manage, uh, you know, violence against women or violence against children. So uh, I didn't even know that she was being abused by her husband because she was, uh, he, he was her boyfriend since high school. They got married after college. So 
and 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 later on, I, that's only when I knew that even in high school she was already being physically abused. But uh, but she but hers is a tragic story. But how did that inform you as you carried on with the child protection unit that also welcomed women? Uh, a success story, perhaps, of someone you saw through and are in touch with right now. A lot of our a lot of our patients. The, the abused children, their moms are also abused. Uh, there's such a big uh, overlap between abused women and, and, and children. And uh, that's why it's very difficult to manage them separately because, um, because they go together. Mother and children go together. And um, it, it's, it's for us, our work is to be able to give that woman the choice that uh, she can make a choice. She can still stay or she can leave. And whatever decision she makes, it can be done because she has the support that she needs. So we do have, you know, many women who have successfully, you know, um, gone on with their lives with their children um, and do it successfully. I mean, um, but it takes time. And uh, one of the things, though, is that you have, for a big part of the, big, you know, of that separation, the how to keep them safe because they can truly be harmed, you know, is the challenge, really. But uh, but they can, you know. Uh, so that's why um, also having places where they can go so that the, they will not be found you know, it's also important and there are not so many of that in our country. But they're relative, you know, the thing is some relatives are helpful and some relatives are not. Uh, that's what we found out also because there are relatives who say, oh, you should stay. You know, uh, what it's marriage is forever. And so you should stay and just grin and bear it. But, but you see, even children just witnessing the violence between the father and the mother, that's also experiencing vi violence themselves. So there are really times when it's, it's just not viable anymore, that they really have to leave and make a new life. And it's possible. For those who've done it and made it possible, have you been in touch with them and how are they? Um, we, once they're on with their lives, you know, we don't keep on, <laughs> you know, we're just there for the times when they would need us. And of course, there's some who would come back and, and thank us, but, but we would want them to go be free and live their lives without us trying to, you know, to uh, our help. Uh, they, they also have a right to refuse it. You know, because that, that's what we mean about having choices. You ask for help when you need it. You could also refuse help if you don't want it, you know. So it's really balancing how to be helpful without being intrusive. It's, it's just heartening to, to hear of these success stories because every now and then we're inundated in the news of, of the sad stories, the sad part of, of this whole phenomenon. For one, for instance, and I, we find this very distressing, I mean, we, we land uh, the news and, and hear of, of the abuse taking place right here in our home front. The BBC World back in tw November 2022 had a headline that put us on the map. And, and the headline went, the Philippines sees a pandemic boom in child sex abuse. I mean, just how bad did it get during the pandemic? Because that was the time that the Philippines had one of the world's longest quarantines yeah. for, for children. Yes. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic, the number of reports uh, and patients coming to the Women and Children Protection Units dropped drastically, like more than 50%. And uh, so we had to investigate why that is when you were really expecting an increase. And um, our theory is that it's, the drop was because they could not access the services because 
the perpetrator is right there at home. Uh, there's quarantine. They're afraid to go to the hospital because of COVID and so forth. And um, and and so that's why we went into tele child protection units, you know, so that they could get the services right there in the barangay. At the same time, uh, of course, we, ha we wanted to find out if truly this increased or not. Um, there, one of the studies done at that time uh, was disrupting harm. And it was an online, uh, it was, the investigation was on online child sexual abuse and exploitation. It was a 13 multi-country study, 13 countries. And the findings of that study is, again, unfortunately, the Philippines has the highest, you know, um, prevalence. And um, one can even say that in 2020, that's the first year of the pandemic, there was at least 2 million children uh, who have been victims of child online sexual abuse and exploitation. And that's a high number, very high number. And um, and the issue there is, you know, um, how did this happen? Yeah, and who are the perpetrators? Um, yeah, in that study, what was different was that if you look at the different ages, if you're looking at young children, um, the customers might be uh, foreigners, okay, but the facilitators and the one who committed the abuse that were videotaped were relatives. So, so, you, so they're also part of the abuse. Both the customer and the facilitator all were abusing, were abusing these children. So of course the question was, um, is this because of poverty? You know, so it's a way of earning money because uh, those who were apprehended when they were interviewed um, the mother would say it's really because we're poor and, and we needed the money uh, to survive. Um, yes, you know, one would say that poverty has, uh, has a role there, but not always. Because um, if you look at the older age groups, then here you have also um, not only foreigners, but also Filipinos, wherein they're using the internet to groom the, the children so that they will commit sexual acts and then they will uh, blackmail the children to give more uh, uh, sexual abuse images, you know, and, and it, it's like a vicious cycle. And that's just one part, sexual abuse under child, children, violence against children, because you also have to consider physical violence mm. as well as psychological violence. Mm. It's a silent war that you have to treat when a child faces that, and data just before the pandemic revealed that this has really gone on. Uh, it's It's been prevalent even before the pandemic. Oh, yes. The statistics from way back 2016 show that this had been on an increase. Right. It's not well, just sexual abuse, but physical yes. violence and psychological violence. Yes. Um, the findings of that national baseline study in 2016 showed that three out of five Filipino child uh, has experienced either physical abuse or psychological abuse. So it's it's very common. We have not yet repeated that study, but the National Demographic and Health Survey uh, came out in 2022. Uh, they were able to insert the child discipline module in the, uh, uh, in the 2022 NDHS, and it still had the same prevalence of viol uh, physical violence against children. Around, and that doesn't even... Um, around 58%. Yeah. 58% is a staggering number. And that doesn't even include child neglect. No, no, doesn't include so child neglect. If, if we were to look at how we compare with the rest of Asia, how do we stack up with which such staggering numbers and the scope under which we consider violence against children? How do we fare? Very poorly, we How are poorly? yeah because we we are when when we of course the problem with uh, comparing prevalence studies is that um, the instruments might be different, uh, but to those who have done a violence against children survey uh, similar to the Philippines, like Laos, Cambodia, for example, Indonesia. Um, 
their numbers are less than ours. Yeah, so that's why I say we're doing poorly. Uh, it's because the other Asian countries have a, a little bit better, not so much better, but uh, just a little lower than ours. Like if we're in the 50%, they're in 30%, that kind of difference. Yeah. And what's even more disturbing is there's there's a rise in the number of HIV AIDS cases, mm. according to data uh, that had just been revealed. It's it's really the young mm. that are catching this disease. Is there a correlation between the rise in HIV AIDS and abuse against children? Yes, you know. So the Philippines is one of eight countries. Uh, uh, in Asia that is responsible for the 80% rise in HIV, you know, so we're one of the few remaining countries where HIV is still rising. And when you look at the statistics of the Philippines, you will see that the rise in terms of the age group is among the youth. So 51% are in the age group of uh, 24, you know, to 30. But if you, but 29% uh, is in the age group of 15 to 24. Um, and when you, when they were discovered, this is severe HIV. So that means that they probably got HIV when 10 years before, when they were in their teens. And when the Department of Health look at what was the mode of transmission of this HIV, um, 60% was male to male sex. And so our hypothesis is that at least one of the partners uh, might be in his teens and, and one might be an adult and that would be sexual abuse. Now, some are saying that, you know, maybe, you know, the, that there was consent, that the, the, there was no forcing anybody but you see, when we talk about consent, we also have to consider the power difference, including age. So if there's a significant age difference between two partners, even if you say that they both consented, abuse is still happening because the younger partner is being manipulated. You know, and uh, there is no consent there, especially in our new uh, age of sexual consent law. Um, the um, a minor can only consent to sex when they're 16. Younger than that, it's statutory rape. Let me yeah. pick up on laws because the UNICEF did recognize the Philippines as having advanced laws, mm. protecting children. Yes. And, yes. and you've named one of them, and that would be um, Strong Laws in Child Protection, the Minimum Age Republic Act, 11648, mm. that would be establishing the minimum age for statutory rape. And then we also have Republic Act 11930, punishing the perpetrators for online sexual abuse and exploitation mm -hmm. of children. And we also have Republic Act 11596, prohibiting child marriage. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we have a disturbing number of cases of child violence even as we have really strict and advanced laws in protecting children. Where do you think the disconnect comes from? The disconnection is in the implementation of these laws. Uh, I think that in terms of laws, uh, we have very good laws and that we are even examples to the rest of the world on the laws that we make. Uh, but now implementing those laws, we're really doing poorly. And uh, I think in general, that is the impression of Filipinos, you know, very excellent in planning, but not in implementation. Yeah, unfortunately. Is, is there a case study, uh, best case perhaps overseas, um, in implementing laws mm -hmm. for, for protecting children, for us to be able to, to pattern after? We already have the laws, we just are weak, as you say, in implementation. Well, there are some, there are some countries uh, who have made a lot of progress, even say for uh, the law banning corporal punishment. And Sweden is uh, one example of being uh, successful. You know, when, 
Sweden instituted their, their law banning corporal punishment. That was like so long ago, like more than 20 years ago. And when they instituted that law, corporal punishment was very high in Sweden, you know, but they were able, you know, to, but you see, when we talk about implementation, uh, it's not only punishment, you know, it's not just getting people and then punishing them if they, uh, well, of course, there's some that really need to be punished. <laughs> But also, you, you should be able to enable people to be able to follow, to follow the law. Um, as, for example, when we are talking about the age of statutory rape, um, we first of all need to inform everybody about this law. And then uh, when we talk about the schools, uh, we still have not instituted the comprehensive sexual education which is again in another law, the uh, repro reproductive health law, which says that there should be, you know, comprehensive sexual education in schools. And until now, that is also not implemented, you know. So in terms of implementation, um, uh, there are many, well, when you say models in other countries, it's not really rocket science <laughs> in terms of uh, implementation. Yeah, it just means that you give res the resources, you know, you give the, uh, and uh, you, you have the budget and the manpower to be able to implement these laws. And, and yeah. to enable the child. And, 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 and uh, yeah, and accountability. Yeah, yes. I mean, accountability is also inherent in, in these laws that uh, people are accountable for their actions. Um, yes, there are laws that uh, you are empowering the child, but we always say that when we talk about child protection, while you could teach children on how to protect themselves, still ultimately it should be the adults who, who should be protecting children. Because, uh, for example, in incest, which is also a big problem in our country, even if you tell the child to say no, how, how could they say no to people who are responsible over them like their parents? You know, they, 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 they cannot, they're so dependent on their parents. So really, um, we need the political will, uh, we, we, we need, the, and, and that means having the resources and the budget and, and the training, you know, of, of people uh, to give them the capacity to be able to implement these laws. Just carrying on in, in that legal discussion line of, of a narrative with enabling the child, it, it, under the Philippine law, to my understanding, there should be a complainant. Mm. And oftentimes it's the child who really has to be the complainant but that's the burden out. the yeah. burden is on the child, child yes. to actually prove that something wrong had been done to him or her that, that you know i'm always on my bully pulpit <laughs> about <laughs> why the child you know should be the complainant it should not be it should be people of the philippines you know it's a public law it's not you know a personal you know personal law so it should be people of the Philippines versus whoever is the offender. For example, you know, we've never successfully prosecuted any shaken baby, you know, where they, the baby is shaken so violently that their brain bleeds and uh, at least 25% of those babies would die. And if they live, 90% would be living with serious consequences, like they could be, have cerebral palsy, they could be blind, they could have mentally challenged, you know, so, but we've never ever, you know, successfully prosecuted such a case because how can a baby be a complainant? It just doesn't make sense, you see. And of course, the parents who are the, in these cases, it's usually one of the parents who is the guilty party, they're not gonna file a complaint against their partner. So that's why uh, no one has ever successfully prosecuted but shaken we, baby. We could end up with a social worker then uh, being the complainant 
in in your bully pulpit. Y yes. If, if it were to be, if you were to be followed, then that would be the case. Yes. The if you look at the our anti-child abuse law and they enumerate there who the complainants are. The social worker could be a complainant, but social workers are afraid. You know, they they're afraid to be the complainant. So, so no one, none of them would, why is would that? take why, on why to be the complainant. Why would the social worker be afraid? Because then that means they'll be the one like carrying that case in court, and then they get threatened uh, by the perpetrator's family. You know, and um, they don't want that. And and if they're a powerful person, uh, then the then the social worker can even be out of a job. See. And people don't understand shaken baby, and and one of the reasons why they cannot understand is because they think about themselves and say that I can never do this to a baby. How can anyone ever do this to a baby? So it's not possible that a parent will do this to a baby. But that's what we see. The doctor cannot be the complainant. The doctor is the expert witness in court. So you cannot be the complainant. Yeah. And on top of that, the struggle on accessing mental health, because this also involves psychological violence, as physical violence and child abuse, sexual abuse happens. But the problem is, in this country, there's, there's really not much uh, psychiatrists, not many psychiatrists and psychologists that we can turn to for help. So how do you employ that holistic approach with mental health hanging in the balance mm. in, in having to, to help an abused child? Yeah. Um, we have just so few uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and we're just starting with clinical social work. So it's just in the beginning stages. So um, it, it's such a precious resource. So right now what we're doing is um, we're doing training for, uh, it's called tasks shifting, that some mental health, ther some therapies can be delivered by non-mental health persons. So for example, for uh, sexual abuse, those who have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, can be treated with uh, what we call cognitive behavioral therapy with a trauma focus. And we have adapted that to the Philippine setting it's uh, and it's, it's called TIP, Trauma-Informed Psychosocial Processing. And it can be delivered by social workers, even teachers, nurses, um, who are trained on that. But they have to be under the supervision of a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But we have started already, you know, we, we have uh, trained several already. And, and so um, that's like a temporary measure. Uh, while we hope we're, we're, we're training more psychologists and psychiatrists, but that will take a long time. So, so meanwhile, we're doing that. And the other thing that we're doing is with telepsychiatry. So with the tele, I was telling you about the tele child protection units in barangays. So now we're also trying to see whether psychiatrists across the country can be part of the program so that even say a psychiatrist is in Iloilo, who is part of this telepsychiatry program, can through telepsychiatry can deliver uh, that therapy to say in Mindanao you know, to an, a tele-CPU hub in Mindanao. So at least it will extend the reach. Um, it, it's, it still will not solve all our problems. You know, it, these are all just trying to do the best that we can with making maximum use of whatever resource that we have. And we know that's still not enough, but at least, you know, we're progressing. Yeah, if, yeah. if there's one thing that COVID did, it was really to give birth to that tele CPU, which you didn't have and which you're keeping within the uh, Women and Child Protection Unit. But at the same time, we're faced with the return of kids to schools. Mm. So we're now seeing teachers, educators faced with children who tell stories. Mm. 
and get to realize that they have been abused. Right. How prepared are our educators in, in helping them get over the abuses that they faced at home during the lockdown? I don't think and they're prepared. They're you not know, prepared. You know, isn't it that it was just like a couple of months ago that the headlines was 404 uh, elementary, uh, well, I don't know if they were elementary students, but students, and you know, committing suicide. Um, and when you look at the statistics of the Department of Health, uh, the, 20, the, the latest was the 2020 statistics, for the 10 to 14 year olds, the number eight cause of death is self-harm, you see. So I said that has to be investigated on why it shouldn't be number eight cause of death for a 10 to 14 year old age group is self-harm. What happened there? Um, certainly one of my suspicion is that they have been abused. What else? You know, because usually even uh, mental health symptoms, depression, etc. what it certainly happens in younger children, it's not as common you know, enough to, for suicide to be a number eight cause of death for that age group. Um, and and uh, looking at the researches being done on, on mental health during COVID in general, they also found this latest meta-analysis, you know, found that going back to school is also a stress. So while maybe the child has been coping, you know, uh, is already stressed, and but has been coping prior to the now face-to-face, -face, the face-to-face -face was actually another stress if, because the children were not prepared to be suddenly be back into this uh, classroom. And so we, we have another project, actually, we call it Safe Schools. Uh, we did the research prior to COVID. Um, and initially, our goal there was to prevent sexual abuse, especially uh, peer-to-peer -peer sexual abuse, dating violence, you know. And that was for grade seven and grade eight because most of our sexual abuse patients seen in the women and children protection units were aged 13 to 15 years old. So we wanted to get them before they were 13 uh, for a preventive project. And uh, we worked with the Department of Education with this. And it was, and the proof of concept showed that it reduced sexual violence, and at the same time, it also reduced bullying, and improved, you know, the mental health of the students, like emotional regulation, you, you know, um, and risk-taking behavior. So we said uh, what we used here was mindfulness, you know, and so mindfulness for the teachers and mindfulness for the students, and now we are. Go trialing for the whole city of Valenzuela um, to see whether this would work for all, you know, so it will be all the elementary, uh, well, grade se high school, grade seven and grade eight uh, students in uh, public schools in Valenzuela will be undergoing this curriculum. It's good that you mentioned the preventive side because much of our conversation really had been on the response side. So preventive um, solution to, to child uh, protection also includes changing the norms. Mm, right. The norms and, and the practices because this is the one that will enable parents to be good parents to children and really get rid of the problem of having to, to, pre to, to respond to when it's already late. Right. But how far down are we when we talk about the different stakeholders, you've mentioned stakeholders like the educators, uh, medical practitioners, um, and and those in the legal fields, yeah. very much involved as well as in the hospital. So, so another project that we have is uh, this time it's with Ateneo, uh, the Manila University is what parenting for lifelong health, and uh, this this evidence with this parenting for lifelong health that it can reduce child maltreatment especially physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect. And so we adopted to the Philippine setting, the Parenting for Lifelong Health. It's now called Masayang Familia in the Philippines. And uh, a randomized controlled study, which is really one of the best forms of research that could be done, uh, showed that it can reduce as much as half also 
child maltreatment like physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, neglect, uh, increase the parent's efficacy in terms of parenting, even decrease domestic violence. And, 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 and so we have now adapted, uh, we work with DSWD so that Masayang Familia is also being instituted among the four peace families. And, um, and we're very happy with that. It's uh, part of the FDS, you know, the family development sessions of DSWD. And uh, we hope that this uh, Parenting for Lifelong Health or Masayang Familia in the Philippines will be available nationwide. And uh, of course, there are many parenting programs. But what we're saying is that the parenting programs that should be used should be those that have evidence to work because it's not just what you are saying, it's how you're teaching. So one of the results of many studies already globally show that just lecturing to parents does not work. Yeah, the strategy here should be that the parents should, should be able to practice, you know, role playing and they're supported in their parenting, you know. So, so the way that this parenting program is taught is just as valuable as the content, you know. So that's why, uh, but we're looking at ways and means how parenting should be, uh, this evidence-based parenting program should be universally available for the whole country. And we hope that it's really one, you know, excellent strategy uh, to decrease our physical and emotional violence. And international peers are already looking at the Philippines, like, mm -hmm. like Pakistan. I mean, you've been to Lahore yeah. and uh, Peshawar. Yes. For, for this very same um, child protection system. Yes. How, how is that going and what are you learning from it that you can probably take back to the Philippines? So we're, we're in that Pakistan was many years ago uh, and what we did there was to help them establish their child protection unit in their children's hospitals, you know, in Lahore and in Peshawar. And uh, they're still doing it now. Um, it has not expanded to the whole of Pakistan, but, this, uh, but these child protection units are really doing an excellent work, you know, like in Lahore. At the very, I've been in touch with uh, pediatricians who are doing this in, in Lahore. Um, our new initiative now is with Vietnam. So we're working with UNICEF Vietnam uh, to establish also child protection units in the children's hospitals in Hanoi. But we're just starting there. But while I was in Vietnam, which was just like, you know, less than a month ago, um, I also looked into their hotline you know, they have a hotline for child abuse. And I was very impressed with their hotline. What impressed me is that their hotline has a lot of power. Be their hotline is a government hotline. They have social workers and psychologists working in that hotline. The hotline has the power, you know, that when they refer to whether it's a social work or to the police, they have to do what the hotline says. And they have to report back to the hotline what it is that they have done in response. You know, so they have that power. Unlike here, our hotlines don't have that power. In a sense, they just would report to the local social welfare officer and, and you are at their mercy whether they will respond to you or not. You do not have the power to command them, you know, to respond. So how can we break that? Um that disconnect, if you will, and and the lack of an enabling factor. What what needs to happen? Is it the Philippine Development Plan to end mm. violence against children? I mean, that's something that is now being worked on mm -hmm. to get all the agencies involved, involved in in helping children to come together and make sure that they just have one unified strategy, and break down the silos yes. in the bureaucracy. Uh, Yes, we need to break down the silos. I agree with that first statement. But uh, the, you know, that Philippine plan to end violence against children, it has already run its course. You know, it's a, it was a five-year plan. It ended 2022. You see, when you look at that plan, it didn't have a budget, really. 
when we talk about investment in a plan, you, you, you should have targets, you know, and uh, yearly targets. You should have the strategy on how to get that target, just like any business, for example. And that what, what is needed to get the target. And definitely, you need a budget, you need the manpower, you need the monitoring and evaluation to see where you are, you know, in, tr in reaching those targets. And that was not done, you see. So if we want this, continue this plan, and remember that, you know, we are also part of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. It's only seven years from now. And, uh, and for us to reach the goal for ending violence against children is SDG 16. Uh, we found you know, that we're not even monitoring the violence against children. You know, when we look at the Philippine report for SDG 16, there was no statistics on violence against children. What was reported there was homicide. And the homicide was not even about homicide of children. It was just the homicide rate in general, nothing about violence against children. So if you don't measure and you don't monitor, it's not going to happen. So, so we need to measure and monitor also yeah, yeah, to, for, and to know whether we're achieving our targets or not. And, but in the first place, we should have a target. How many percent are we going to lower, you know? So what we don't even a good, have a target. What would be a good metric to begin with, to guide our policymakers? So if we had that national baseline survey, which says, for example, that physical violence is, say, approximately 60%, you know, uh, we should be able to say, so in, in five years, well, if we, SDG 2030 is in seven years, but say in five years, what is possible for us in terms of reduction? Uh, are, we, are, we, are we going to be able to reduce it by what, 20%? Okay, so from 50, we go to 30, uh, 60 to, to uh, minus, say, 40%? Or, or can we do it by half? And, and so, and how do we do that? See, actually, that plan already has key result areas. And one of that for violence uh, is the parenting. So how can we now, if parenting can reduce physical violence by half, if it is now available and reach enough parents, then we should be able to reduce violence against children by half. So how do we reach enough number of parents to be able to reduce this? I mean, that's part of the planning. And so, and, and, and then you put in, in the strategy, who should be doing the parenting, you know, what is the budget, what, what, what the training needs, and all that should be part of the plan. And somebody should be responsible for it to plan. Because you cannot have everybody planning and have their own plans. There should be one coordinated plan. And it should be monitored to say, okay, so are we reaching our target? Are we, are we reaching and have we trained enough uh, parenting facilitators? for them to deliver to X number of families. And, and who, who, where are these facilitators coming from? Department of Social Welfare? From should it? should yeah? it come from the DSWD? From, but DSWD alone cannot do it. It needs also like, can we get the Department of Health? You know, um, can we get, you know, civic organizations? You know, can we like Rotary, for example? Can, uh, can we get uh, uh, parishes, the churches, to be also be doing parenting? Uh, can, you know, so, so you, can we do parent-teacher associations in schools to reach enough parents? So that's all part of the planning. Corporations? Corporations, yes. Because corporations have, um, have parents, <laughs> you know, the, the people working there are parents, so should corporations have parenting? And in fact, in Malaysia, for example, they're looking at ways where parenting is part of insurance, you know, so that uh, it's compensated. So, uh, so all of these strategies, someone has to be coordinating and planning. There's a central planning. 
Yeah. I'm glad that we got talk about parenting because it's it's really become central um, to the whole discussion of not only the response but the prevention of of child abuse in in any country. Uh, but it's it's really interesting that you you yourself have chosen to be single blessed. Yeah, and <laughs> you're not a parent. No, but you're no, no. Children. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I always, I'm always asked why uh, I'm not married, and I always say I haven't found the better half. <laughs> <laughs> well, this project of yours might as well be. And it is indeed a very noble and a very admirable task. Thank you so much, Dr. Madrid, for this opportunity. All the best. Yes, thank you, Patsy. Yeah. And catch us again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. on Manila time on One News. You can also check out The Long Conversation on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. I'm Kathy Yang, and this is Thought Leaders.